Hey everybody, welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast and today I welcome my good friend Brent Denure from Vintage Fire Truck Equipment. Brent's president for an awesome company called Vintage Fire Truck Equipment based in America. Brent and his teams are dedicated to the history and preservation of firefighting apparatus. It's a magazine for the enthusiasts made by the enthusiasts. Now, these guys serve thousands of subscribers in over 10 countries. So if you're the kind of person who've experienced that rush of being on the fire truck with those vivid lights and piercing sirens rushing to an emergency, you're the sort of person that loves those flowing lines, the sparkling chrome and the artistic beauty of the rigs and the fire engine juicy all over the world. We also talk a lot about the collectors. So collectors of these models and equipment are a massive sector of society that really show an enormous amount of passion and ignite that enthusiasm for vintage fire trucks and equipment all over the world vintage fire truck creates six issues every single year full of an awesome amount of photos information they talk about some of the big game changes that you see talk about fire hoses the equipment the people and the odd retro ad there's also nothing better than hearing the stories of the vintage apparatus you know how did the things come about how did the equipment get made what were the different innovations that happened over the years what is the history from those who have spent time actually doing it there's also plenty of tips tricks and techniques for everything from buying your first rig to restoring the equipment and organizing your very own muster. A big thanks once again to our long-term sponsor, William Wood Watches. William Wood Watches is a UK-based watch manufacturer where upcycling is taken to a whole new level. William Wood are all about history on your wrist and feeling the beat of the fire service with you every step of the way. William Wood Watches has the vision to be the leading sustainable watch brand that upcycles rescue service materials for a new life, once forgotten, now reborn. So get over, have a look, get yourself registered and check out some of the incredible stuff at William Wood watches.com i really really enjoyed my chat with brent today he's such an interesting guy i know you're gonna enjoy this one the audio in it was a little bit scratchy we're coming all the way from america remember but the content is absolutely awesome we touch base on several different innovations as the fire service and the equipment changed over the years thank you for coming back to the firefighters podcast thank you for listening in i know you're gonna love this one so buckle up for safety and i will see you on the other side Pete? Brent, how's it going, my man? Doing really well. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound fantastic. Oh, you look fantastic. <laughs> Always a charmer. I love your style. You look so comfy. I'm st- I'm all stood up. I'm all uh, I'm all official. I love the- what's oh, that behind you on the wall? What's on the wall? Oh geez. Ow, I'm falling apart here. <laughs> um the big poster is from Firefest twenty thirteen or fourteen. Wow. With a few of our special guests on it and just some pictures of some rigs that were down at, down at the show. Yeah, wow. this is uh, this is where I can do a lot of the writing and kind of get creative for the magazine one. You have to have that special spot. This is the, the hub, if you will. So we've got my space, then I've got my wife sits down there. My daughter has got her office on the left. I say office, she's eight years old. She does a lot of messing about. <laughs> and, that's, yeah. and we have obviously the big whiteboard. You've got to have the whiteboard for all the creativity. That's, uh, that's what tends to happen in here. We get Absolutely. in here, throwing stuff on the whiteboard. I'm a big visual thinker. I've got to have it up there in front of me. Yeah, no, me too, man. Me too. It's the only way to do it. So thank you so much for uh, spending some time with me today, my man. For anybody that's unfamiliar, I'll just wind it up. Brent, you are the president of Vintage Media and Vintage Fire Truck Equipment, which is a hell of a mouthful. Yeah. I feel uh, incredibly lucky I'm holding in front of me now. I've actually fallen in love with the 1912 Centrifugal, and I want to just jump ahead of ourselves. So, um, you sent over some wonderful, really glossy documentation and, and sort of the, the magazines around the vintage fire truck stuff, and my daughter has not put them down. She, she tends to oh. run to uh, gran- granny and granddad or anybody that she can to show them their uh, favorites. I feel quite bad now because every time we go to the fire station, all the stuff that I use now is pretty rubbish. <laughs> Lily, oh. She's like, daddy, why is, why is your fire engine not look as nice as that one? And I says, well, you know, baby, it's just it's what daddy's got to play with at the minute. I haven't got any of the same ones that Brent's got. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, no, we're, uh, we're very fortunate. The magazine is widely celebrated by those in the hobby and uh, mm. those in fire service. We pride ourselves on offering a pretty premium product with the paper and the gloss and a high, a high quality finish so uh, yeah we're having a lot of fun and the program's really growing nicely for us. so for people that are unfamiliar with it first and foremost when when did this passion of yours sort of get started with it and i know we're going to go into the detail of just just a couple of the the favorite pieces that we have but where firstly where did your passion with the fire service in general or certainly pumps uh, come from well it uh, it was kind of born into me i grew up into it my, my dad bought his first fire truck the year i was born really and uh a year after but just when i was 
this, uh, I wasn't even walking. There was a rig in his, uh, in his garage. At his. My, my father, he's the one. I mean, he's the one that introduced me to it. He uh, had uh, had a huge affinity for, for going to parades and special events and wanted to buy a fire truck mm. just because he saw how much uh, fun we're having with them. And uh, that kind of just grew into this kind of crazy state we're at now where we've got a few rigs in our collection and a magazine and, and organizing events. That, what, uh, what drove him busy. to get his first one? Because that is, you know, talking about it and doing it are two very different things because it's not, it's not like buying a new TV or saying you're quite interested in golf and getting a set of golf clubs. This is a hell of a commitment. That kind of a guy who's a very passionate man, and uh, he always has been. And he's very community minded, very community oriented. And uh, back in 1979, uh, the year I was born, he was part of a he was on a committee for a plowing match, a big community event. And part of his responsibility with his involvement with the plowing match was to go to parades. Okay. and have a float and promote the event. And uh, when the event came and went, uh, he all of a sudden had no reason to go to the parades, but he really liked going to the circuit. And he he absolutely, uh, he, he loved seeing uh, all the smiles on other faces with all the people. His, his the kind of mantra was, he loves the parade because everybody can afford the price of admission. And absolutely. basically a fire truck was his fire truck was his ticket back into the parade circuit. And uh, he he really kind of fostered a, a desire to uh, to be part of this community. They're great people. And yeah, what started out as one truck, he grew to two or three and he had a bus company so he was uh, fortunate in, in the sense ah, that right. he, so had, he wasn't um, he wasn't intimidated in the same way because i've you know I've, I've had different business ventures and stuff like that but it's never been something big like that because i suppose like you say if he already familiar with that sector and he had a comfort with large vehicles it wouldn't have been as intimidating for him because i'm sure there's so many firefighters listening yeah, yeah. who are like oh man i'd love my own truck and i'd do this with it and i'd do that with it and i'd look after it and i'm like where are you gonna put it you know you must have had an understanding family or an understanding mother who uh, who didn't completely lose lose her mind when the first fire engine just rocked up very patient i've uh, been patient with him and he's patient with me too so but no you're you're spot on I mean, he was fortunate in the sense that his his career his work uh afforded him the ability to to get these big pieces of equipment and uh and roll them in and with when it comes to the fire truck hobby, peak, in a lot of cases, it's very inexpensive to get in. It can be expensive to maintain, and you know, if uh, something goes wrong, you can have a big bill. But a lot of these rigs, you know, at that time, you're buying for maybe anywhere from a thousand to three thousand, four thousand dollars. So really? It's not. Uh, it's not like that. It just seems exactly. crazy. So, I mean, the, and the- now I think about it, I totally see where you're coming from because they're purpose-built vehicles, so you can't really. You know, once they they end come to their end of life of their operational duty, there's not really many other functions mm-hmm. you can use a fire engine for. But that must have changed. Right. I mean, I, I know I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves, but you say it was, it was inexpensive back then to get into. Have you ever experienced? I've heard quite a lot that fire engines are quite difficult to get hold of now because of this whole sort of Trojan horse analogy. Have you have you heard anything about that? Does that make a sense? A little bit. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, I I know the, when you talk about the Trojan horse analogy, I know exactly. Uh, what you're referring to, but I don't think it any more difficult now than it was back then. Okay. I mean, according to what you said, they're, they're purpose built. They have uh, a service life, and then uh, when standards or technology changes, and especially during the era of the rigs that we cover, in a lot of cases, they went to cab to having to be closed cab and no more riding on the tailboard. So really. Uh, when it comes to the intrinsic value of the piece, in a lot of cases, it's just the scrap metal because because they really don't have functional purpose anymore. <laughs> um, now, when it comes to, and it depends, it depends on the collector and it depends on the piece, right? If you've got a piece that served the FDNY that has a uh, pedigree attached to 911, I mean, obviously that's going to just heighten demand. So yeah. what otherwise would have been a pedestrian piece uh, all of a sudden because it was attached to a significant event or, or served with a big department, obviously the... Uh, the price curve can change a little bit. Yeah, not all sort of collectors of these indiv- of these items are sort of born equally, if you will. And what I mean by that is, what is the world of fire operational vehicles or fire service trucks collectors? Because this is a whole subsector that I'm only just sort of discovering. There's some incredible people with some real passion in some of the vehicles. And when when did you first, other than obviously your dad's integration with it, you could have gone your own path, but you decided to double down and have your own passion with it. Oh, Pete, yeah, and you're exactly right. Like. Uh... I grew up going to events with my dad, like a lot of kids grew up going fishing with their dad, right? Like in the yeah. summertime, we would go to, yeah, well, like we'd go to certain events, like there were the five or 10 events we'd go to every summer, and that was our time to go. Mm. And then as a teenager, and especially teenager, I was a hockey player, I kind of grew out of it and found partying and girls and all the all the other things. And, <laughs> yes. uh, in, my mid, in my mid to late 20s, my nephew uh, actually was a catalyst for my getting back into it. And I took him to the same events I went to as a kid uh, with my brother in law. 
we had uh, we had some fantastic memories and just uh, the the community really grew me. I mean, uh, you talk about the different collectors and uh, my friend Bill. He he kind of said it the most eloquent way. There's so much passion for the rigs and for the meaning behind them and and the fact that they were uh, tokens of pride for the communities they serve. Yeah. And when you collect get them, there's some people that scratch and claw to stay in the hobby because they just have to scratch and claw to be in the hobby. There are other people that they can't spend their own interest in in the hobby, but when we're all together, you wouldn't know one from the other. It's a, mm. it's a very sincere group, just wonderfully magnificent people in so many cases. And uh, you're right. The passion burns deep. And if, if you want to do a compare and contrast, and I, I'm going to use a wide brush here, but uh, growing up, you'd go to car shows mm. and it's not uncommon for a car collector to maybe have one or two cars that are his or her pride and joy but they won't take that car out if it's too sunny because they don't want the leather to crack in the seats. They won't take it out if it's rainy. And if you're at a yeah, car show, yeah, yeah. they a little car show. It's not uncommon to see a lot of these owners just, you know, park themselves in a lawn chair beside their car and they're proud to answer any question, but they want you to make sure if you're taking a picture, you take it on the right angle and whatnot. You go to a fire truck and then you go to a muster. These guys cut loose. It doesn't matter if it's sunny or rainy and they're all about having a good time and, and uh, really sharing the experience with people of all ages. And, uh, yeah, I've never been in a fire truck freighter event without uh, seeing somebody in a stroller and somebody with a walker, and they both have a smile on That's it, isn't it? And I think there's something so unique about that when, even when we do community events in the UK, people, they don't just want to look at these things. They want to see, they want to touch them, they want to feel them. You know what I mean? They are such. Um, because like you say, each position on a fire truck is where some individual has stood and, and fought on the proverbial front line to protect their community. And they stand for so much more than the, their metallic sort of existence, if you will. Now, when your dad went into his, mm -hmm. his first ever truck, what was the first truck he got? Oh, he got a Bickle Speedway, the scenario. Um, and I can send you a picture of it. It's, it's still service original. He bought it sight on scene. It's got an 85 foot stick on it, mid mount uh, open cab, Bickle Seagrave. It's a 1950, maybe a 51. I think it's a 50, but still in the collection. And, and every time I walk by it in the warehouse I, uh, and we're together, I kind of said, you know, that's, that's the rig right there that started this whole thing for us. And uh, it's going to forever have a special place in our heart. Big V12 Lycoming engine with 24 plugs in it. It's, uh, it's just a big, it's a big ox of a rig. And uh, <laughs> it's funny, uh, it's Brian, my buddy Chris, uh, he, he drives it sometimes in some events and, and he just jokes how he started a second here and seconds up there and thirds down here and <laughs> fourths over there somewhere. You hope that if you find it right, you might find Chris if you get going long enough. So anyway, kind of a... <laughs> I, love it. I, I think to myself these days, because when I was preparing and sort of doing some studying for, for our episode, obviously in and out of watch that I've been on station the last few days. And I got me thinking a lot about the, the pumps on the actual back of all of the rigs, because we've got a couple of recruit firefighters and a few probationers and stuff going through their own development. And when I say to people about firemanship, and I don't mean that in a, in a sexist way, but the sort of intangible training that goes into understanding um, the mechanical advantage that the, the vehicle is trying to give water, effectively, it's trying to impart energy into water. We have these days a lot of smart, smart vehicles, smart calves, computers, and all this sort of stuff that do a lot of the thinking for us. But when I first started, we were having, you know, the water ring primers, the centrifugal pumps, the exhaust gas ejectors, and stuff like that. And we had to actually know something about it. And it wasn't until I was looking back through some of the documentation and some of the great stuff that you've sent me. When did you see, and maybe you'll, you'll know far better than I will, some of the big changes in the way that the vehicles actually imparted energy into water? So sort of the timeline, if you will, of how the pumps sort of came to where they are. I suppose. Right, right. And, you know, Pete, that's a, that's a layered question, a very fascinating question. And you can apply it to more than just water because you can, you can also apply it to the aerial devices. But mm. uh, when did I notice it? Let me put it this way. By nature, man is about progression. Absolutely. Okay. So we've got this. How can we do it better? And I get that. But I'd also say that if you come and you look at it from a very objective, linear standpoint, you have a pendulum going toward progression, but it can also project beyond its kind of point of value in certain cases. Like when they were back doing the box hand pump, I mean, that's the best they had. And then all of a sudden, you're going to do steam and get pressure, and all of a sudden, you can get a thousand gallons a minute, and you don't need two teams of 24 guys <laughs> busting their backs to, to provide that. Mm. That's a big set, man. That's huge set. Mm. And then you get into the you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, where you uh, start introducing, you know, the, uh, the pedo and being able to 
control the pump off the, the engine of the rig. You're spitting out, you know, 1,000, 1,500 gallons a minute, unless you've the, got the super pumper system in New York and then about eight, 9,000 gallons a minute. Mm. That is very significant. Now, companies and trying to be competitive, it, it's interesting because there have been some great designs along the way. And if you, if you look at Game Changers, uh, a model of rig that just blows me away is Dick Young's uh, Crusader, which was introduced in the late 60s. Had, as for, for pumping platform, Pete, had some amazing, amazing advancements in, in design and ingenuity and just how I'm looking at simply, that one now. That's the Game Changers I've, I've got in front of me now. That's, uh, that's some of the biggest things there. And to me, when you look at technology, I think the late 60s to the early 90s, is for my money the sweet spot when it comes to either delivering water or an aerial device. You had the best last year, or maybe the year before. There's a there's a show uh, run about an hour away from where I live, and uh, a lot of antiques were there. But in concert with the rigs, they had a brand new T Rex aerial platform. This thing was like a transformer. Feat. I mean, it had the articulating. <laughs> the, you know, the operator no longer has to stand and and use control. He or she can sit in a in a nice chair and just do everything by remote and then when it comes to putting it away they just push a button and pack itself up and it's a you know a tidy package again that scares the hell of me in some cases because if you think of all the technology and engineering that goes into that you can be on a on a call and all of a sudden the computer decides you know it doesn't like what's going on and I've just shuts it. down i've had that they have to wait for a and it's really worrying and and for for <laughs> new for people that have not been in the, the the job i mean i've only been in the job for 13 years but people that have not even been in two or three years they don't have i mean we actually do mechanical understanding or mechanical reasoning exams now in certain brigades because i find that's one of the biggest things that people don't understand what the vehicle is actually doing they don't understand the mechanics of what is actually being achieved because if you've got a rough understanding of what's being achieved then can you know, work backwards from that and try and problem solve yourself. But if you just think water comes out the end and it comes out really fast and you're like, well, yeah, I don't need to know that. Yeah, well, you do though. <laughs> you know, you really should for your own professional development. But also when there's a problem and, the, you know, there's a fire getting out of control and you've had a pump failure, you need to know where to go to at least, you know, you've got a professional obligation, you know. But also I'm like, God, aren't you interested? I'm having this conversation with you because I'm sincerely interested. I'm excited about it. And I worry that that's one of the things we're missing out the job a little bit at the minute. Oh, and, and you're bang on. And that's what I said. I think the pendulum swung too far. Like in in the day, you had a fire engineer and that was your pump master. That was the guy who understood the physics, understood the mechanics. He wasn't going to push anybody over, was going to deliver the right amount at the right pressure at the right time. Uh, now the FDN lines, God bless them, they're, you know, they're an amazing department. Um, you look at their pump panels, they're all color coded and, and they've tried to make things. And with all due respect, I'm using the term in a very general way, but idiot proof, right? And, I, know, uh, I know, I totally and agree with you. And as, I will, uh, I will support you in saying that because efficiency, I get it. They're like, oh no, you've got so much more stuff to be worrying about and you shouldn't be bogged down with the inner mechanics of the working of that pump because, okay, on certain crews, personnel is a little bit less. You know, we used to ride six on, in the UK now, sometimes I ride for but it's the diminishment of skill sets that really just worries me it really worries me yeah well and uh i don't know if you've heard the one-liner joke my clipboard says i don't i don't need to know that right so <laughs> yeah. um it's just uh it's, yeah. it's been a very interesting evolution how society has just gone to a, a shift where you don't need to know you need to be able to source the information so um you know uh, and that that applies on so many levels. Like when I was a kid, you had to know your matrix for your multiplication timetable off the top of your head. It had to be second nature. Now kids don't need to know that. They just need to know how to get the answer. Mm. And uh, it's just uh, it's just a huge thing. When it comes to the engineering um, and companies and the ongoing effort to always be the best, uh, I think the pendulum swung too far and, and over engineering things and, and sometimes simple is better. And uh, You know, there's somebody at a desk trying to keep themselves relevant by coming up with the next latest greatest thing when you know what, what yeah. we had was okay guys and it's, it's interesting so but anyway it's, it's that whole thing's a machine big than uh, beyond me but uh, it's, uh no, i agree it's with you and it sounds like that. sometimes we're trying to reinvent the wheel in in certain aspects but i believe we've taken our eye off the ball with and this is the very existence of the podcast i suppose in the the teamwork ana- analogy of it and the sort of moral you know teamwork and basically that you see in the fire service and where i see big holes in what we do now 
is, you know, watch culture, pride in the job and that sort of stuff. And and if you don't allow yourself to get what some people would say bogged down in the minutiae of understanding the, the fire department or the fire service, then you can very quickly lose all of the things that are very precious to it. You know, you've got to want to know, you've got to want to know these these small aspects of where did this come from? What was the origin of it? You know, why is it important? If you don't understand the why behind it, then it's hard to, to sustain a passion for it, I suppose. Well, and the evolution and, and kind of psyche of the candidate has really shifted when, uh, you know, you and I are around the same age. I think we're kind of the last generation of the uh, kind of purebred people that, uh, generation that really got into a job because they loved it, right? Um, yeah. If you look at firefighters, responders as a whole, pilots, teachers, the generation of people, I want to be a teacher because I love teaching, or I want to be a firefighter because I love fighting fire, mm-hmm. or, you know, I'm second or third generation is declining, and you're seeing more and more candidates get in because it's a good, oh, look at this, I'm, I'm the benefits I get, and I get a stretch of days off, and it's just unfortunate because that culture and that kind of brotherhood, and don't get me wrong because it's still there, but it's uh, it's definitely different, and especially the elders in the fire truck community, the elders who are collectors and, you know, uh, uh, guys who are 10, 15, 20 years older than me, they, uh, they really have noticed a really significant shift. Mm. But I feel like it's it's that passion that's actually because it's the whole like chicken and egg scenario. Which one comes first? Um, these people have achieved great things, you know, y- yourself and the company that you've built, and honestly, even the, the podcast to a certain extent, I suppose. People, if we use that analogy and we said, "Hey, I, I want to have whatever a podcast that's listened to in over fifty countries and is all this, 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 and the other," but I need to find something that people are going to listen to. If they looked at the same thing as what you're doing and then said, "Oh, I want to." build a magazine or you know have a have a great um, charitable organization that does all these great things but i need to find something i'm passionate about if you try and do that it will never work you know when you first started it it started with the passion there was no end game there was no oh god i hope we can turn this into something one day and it's the same you know the same with the podcast and the same with so many things it has to start with a passion and a curiosity rather than looking at like you said the metrics of what's the income like what's the pension like hang on a minute do you even like it are you even interested in it do you know what i mean because it's not going to be sustainable if you don't have because it's you're always going to have the bad days you're always going to have you know like you'll have had it oh yeah it's all well and good saying you've got x number of trucks and all that sort of stuff but you're still going to get the old donkey when the engine drops out and you know someone damages something or it's not all it's not all roses do you know what i mean the same with me you have the number of trying trying to organize a podcast and people don't show up or hours and hours of editing audio late late into the night do you know what i mean you're always going to have those days and you've got the only thing that's going to get you through those things is the passion no you're right yeah and you're bang on and you know if you look at the magazine it's uh it's an interesting case study for everything you just suggested because I, I was a subscriber and uh, I was just like anybody else who, you know, sent in their, you know, 30, 40 bucks a year and subscribed. Now the, the editor uh, came and did a story on, uh, on, our, on our truck and, and he and I became friends. And then he called me one day and he said, did you get your issue 11? And I said, yeah. And he goes, uh, well, you know, you better frame it. It's going to be a collector's item. So why is that? He said, they're shutting us down. And just as a subscriber, I didn't want to see it go away. I, I really liked the magazine. And um, I, <laughs> I asked him, I said, well, how close are you to breaking even? He said, oh, we're close. And uh, we ended up buying the title for a doll. Now, it was the most expensive dollar I ever spent because <laughs> despite his best. And you know what? We uh, we took it over kind of on a win. And the first uh, couple of years, it was it was pretty tough sledding. And even now, it's, it's like nobody's lighting their cigars with $100 bills at Vintage Fire Truck. It's, <laughs> it's not a money maker. <laughs> <laughs> no, we saw the off or to break even, and we couldn't have more money if we made an inferior product. But as far as I'm concerned, what we create reflects our sincerity and our passion for the community and the hobby. So uh, I don't want to use cheaper paper. I'd rather uh, rather maintain a standard. Mm. No, and, and I totally, I totally agree with that because you know these wouldn't be. Uh, I say Lily, Lily picks them up and she'll take them around the house and all this sort of stuff. But she knows they always come, come back in the study because in, in, because she feels it and you know, and she feels it's not just a, it's not just a crappy newspaper. It's not a piece of magazine. It's not whatever. It's really not to get too bogged down into it, but you know, it's really thick, heavy duty stuff. You know, and that she can't ruin it either. And she looks after it. And it's one of those things. You know, if you put your effort into something, people see that and they, uh, they look after it and respect it. When we talk in terms of the magazine, uh, I consider it uh, an important instrument of recording this information so it doesn't get lost. Mm-hmm. And and we take that very seriously. So I consider my role to be a conduit to try and flush out and funnel and make sure, uh, you know, these stories and these 
these uh, technologies and these evolutions don't get lost in the in the mix because it's, it's too valuable to let it get lost. Absolutely agree, mate. And that you know, I echo that entirely in in audible form. That if we don't capture these incredible individuals, yourself included, and, and you know, document the journey that was gone, because somebody will pick this up. I don't know. I mean, my daughter picks this up. She doesn't. She's not of the age that she fully understands the work and stuff that's gone into this. But these things will stand the test of time, and they'll you know they'll live in people's homes and hopefully inspire future generations of, of firefighters. I want to take us back to um we started we got talking about this 1912 centrifugal pump when it when it first transitioned into that tell us in and around the the origin of this and we spoke about game changers and, and how this first came about well like it says in the article the and echoing what we were saying earlier it really came down to wanting to build a better mousetrap how do we how do we deliver water in a higher capacity in the most efficient way and if you look at the you know the package with the with the platform that it's on there on page 14 not a very big unit, right? These were pumps that were um, that were the next step forward. It even says, uh, you know, U.S. fire apparatus manufacturers relied on proven tried and true pump technology carried over from steam engineers, uh, and namely the rotary gear and reciprocating piston pumps. La France used the rotary gear pumps on its famed Metropolitan steam fire engine, and while the rival Aaron's builders of the popular, popular Continental steamer adopted the piston type pumps. So you. You're in the early 1910s, you're post-industrial revolution. They were trying to migrate from the steam because, and Pete, have you ever had the um, opportunity to see a steam engine in action in real life? Yes, a couple of times in the UK, we have uh, steam fairs and stuff that I've, I've been to, and they are quite a sight to be seen in themselves. I think you and I would be kind by saying they, they require a lot of lot of work. Mm. They're dirty. Oh, gotcha. Um, they're dangerous. You know, they, they, you know, things can go bad quickly <laughs> for yeah. you. and uh when it's all they had it's all they had and when you look at the centrifugal pump it's just really uh as far as i'm concerned and walt could probably you know expand upon it but it's the situation where they're like how do we get this big package this big pump steam pump performance out of something that is smaller that can fit on a chassis of a, of a truck and deliver the same results and do it safe you know they're i'm sure they're like anything else, there were several different concepts and designs, but the centrifugal was was the winner. They ran with that for for a long time, for a long, long time. Delivered a lot of water, saved a lot of lives, and it was a great, great piece of engineering. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think when it comes down to uh, the concept of remotely delivering water, the centrifugal package was safer, smaller, required less manpower, and checked a lot of boxes for, you know, a big step forward in, in water delivery, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely love it. It was really, really interesting for me to read its origins, because it's something I use every day, and I'd never really, quite ignorantly, taken the time to understand its origins. I was more in the depths of how it works and why it works, but uh, it was really interesting for me. When we look at these uh, aerial ladder platforms, when did they first start coming about? Because I'm looking back into some of the uh, sort of turntable ladders. What sort of uh, models have you guys got over there and when did you first start seeing them coming out and i'd have to crack the book open again but i think it was about 1918 when the spring loaded aerial then around 1920 they they really started saying we need to get up high and yeah. we need to be able to do that from a platform we trust and before then and i'm sure we can find pictures of it but there were horse and man-powered wagons that uh, would just you know take a take a stick maybe a 35 40 foot stick on a stretch and they'd have eight or ten guys you know mounted in place mm. and again it's just it's not to sound like a broken record player, but how do we do this better? Well, we make a truck and then, you know, what started out is these really big, powerful uh, springs that, you know, if you ever see those go up, they just, you know, it's a pretty quick action. And yeah, they, I they saw, a, I saw a video of somebody had, uh, had had one and they sort of uh, re-engineered it or whatever. It does go up quite violently. I'm looking back now. Yeah, it's 1868. And then uh, it was Daniel D. Hayes, San Francisco repair shop guy, first brought the spring-raised aerial ladder out in 1902 by the looks of it. Did you know, had its full 360-degree rotation. And uh, it must have been an incredible sight to see for the first people out there using it. And it's probably quite, probably quite scary, to be honest. Uh, yeah, well, I'm sure it was terrifying to a certain extent because you definitely wouldn't want to be on the end of that when they let it go. Um, <laughs> uh, that was, oh, yeah. there, there are a couple of collectors in the area who are good friends. And, and uh, one of them has a 1930 uh, Seagrave killer or Syracuse, New York. It's got the spring load on it. We've seen it go up and it's, it's something to watch, but you look at all that contained energy that's in those springs, again, it, it can it can present a danger. Absolutely. Um, it's a hazard uh, our, our other friend, I want to say it's a 22, 3, 4, 5 American LaFrance. It's a, it's a straight chassis tiller. Mm. 
that's just an experience all onto its own. But it's got the same spring loaded mechanism and you're, you know, you crank the turntable and whatnot. What I find fascinating is that it doesn't matter the generation boys will be boys. And on oh, the, God, yeah. there's a plaque that says, you know, this is for fire use only, only no circus stunts. Don't, don't take it to your kids. Party and just try to impress people because this is a, this is a really important piece of equipment that can be dangerous if not used properly. But they actually have a disclaimer on the ladder saying not to be used for circuit stunts. Really? Official fire use only. <laughs> yeah. So you're not going to tell the boys to behave themselves and just focus on what they needed to do. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking as well when because I, I see when we started to move more towards a safer ability, if you will, it came in sort of the 1958s, uh, the elevation platform, which I think came off the original idea of the like the cherry pickers that they saw used in the parks and stuff like that. That's a hell of a, a, a good looking, it was the Chicago Fire Department came out with their first one. Yeah, they sure did. So they, uh, they were the catalyst in that whole movement. And man, you've seen a lot of them out there. And um, Dick Young tells tells a story about how he had the uh, he had the snorkel rights for New York and kind of the eastern seaboard. Um, Dick Young was a proprietor of Young Fire Equipment, and, and Dick, uh, God bless him, ninety years old, going to be ninety one this year, and still sharp as a whip. And and the stories he can tell Pete would blow your mind. But uh, yeah. he uh, he engineered and did a lot of designing for uh, for fire equipment, fire apparatus uh, platforms. Got the snorkel right. He tells a story, and and uh, it best come from him. But it was either Syracuse or Rochester, New York. Who's I think he was going to do a demonstration, and the uh, the the chief of the department did not want to change from a traditional stick. He just wanted the traditional aerial platform, and okay. and Dick wanted to go and and uh, and show what the snorkel, what the articulating boom could do. Uh, by comparison. So they decided at, at the Rescue and, and Fire Training Services uh, Academy that they would do a, a test and they'd have the, the department bring up their existing aerial and they would go and pluck six people from a building and then they would have the uh, aerial, uh, the platform do the same thing and they'd see how, uh, how it went. And uh, it took a team of four guys to pull up with the aerial. And I want to say it took them over 20 minutes, 22 minutes to pluck six people. And Dick went up with the snorkel and by himself had it done in under four. Wow. So yeah, it was pretty remarkable. Just put that into just real contact. Uh, he had 25% of the manpower and did it in, you know, 20% of the time. It's, uh, well, it's that, a far that smaller that footprint, platform. isn't it? They require a far smaller footprint to operate in as well. So they're much more agile vehicles. Yeah, exactly. They're a lot more agile, a lot more, they're just, just the nature of the engineering, a lot more dexterity and, you know, you can, uh, can kind of thread a needle with it. Mm. Speaking. I'm looking in now at the 1965 diesel engine when the, when the diesel started coming through in their biggest fashion, if you will. What was the biggest difference there? Because I see the fact they went to a the six cylinder engine was was made more of a conventional use, more of a regular thing that they put into a lot of the vehicles. Yeah, the, the diesel thing to me is I've actually never had a conversation with it because I've I've only kind of made mental notes in my own mind's eye, but kind of interesting. The diesel engine itself was around during World War II. They had 671s powering the troop carriers to storm the beaches of Normandy. Yeah. Um, you know, it took 25 years for it to get adopted in the, in the fire service. It, it'd make you wonder why, right? Like transportation companies, bus companies were adopting yeah. diesel and running up and down the road with them, but just fire service really didn't adopt it until the, uh, so probably the mid sixties. And obviously a game changer. I mean, You've got a. Uh, it seems it seems so strange that, that it took kill. them so long to do it, though. Uh, like you say, I don't quite follow yeah. what well, uh, what the thought process was there. And I have no answer for you, other than some things are take longer to adapt. Above and beyond that, a lot of chiefs of, of fire departments are, are deep in tradition, and uh, they just don't like the, the yeah. change, right? It's and to change uh, from from a sensory standpoint, yeah, from a sensory standpoint, diesel is louder. It's smellier, it's more smelly, but I think would be the king's English. It's more offensive as far as the sensory experience, but uh, as soon as those engines started rolling out within 10 years, you know, they'd been adopted by pretty much everybody. Obviously, mm. they go to through to today. So, uh, mm. yeah, uh, more power, easier to maintain, can't kill it. You know, they, they say the more you hate a diesel, you, you know, drive it like you hate it, and that's what the engine wants. So, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, obviously, obviously uh, yeah, just drive it like you hate it. No, I don't 
I don't push our stuff like that, but, uh, but, uh, some guys, they just, they just like to just, you know, line it right up. So I see some really, really incredible, uh, vehicles that we've obviously got documented there. What are some of the most favorite ones that you guys have got? Yeah, you know, we've got, and I don't want to give you the coward answer. It's like choosing the kids. I mean, obviously we bought them because we liked them. You know, um, the kids or the vehicles? But, uh, but, no, the vehicles are like, it's like choosing the, I'll tell you what, we, we've got a few and, uh, We've got a couple of really nice pieces. I enjoy driving anything. I'll drive a golf cart as long as I get to play with it, right? So uh, to me, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't matter. I just, I, I just want to be involved. When it comes to what tickles my fancy, it could be one of the two things. I like trucks that have a, have a pedigree that attaches it to a, to a certain event. Uh, we talked about 9-11 earlier. There's, there's a big Detroit riot here. We've got a couple pieces that responded to that on mutual aid. And just to think that they were there during such a remarkable time in history is something that I put great value on. And neither of these trucks are stunners. Like you'd walk by them in a the garage and, and well, maybe not you, but the average person would walk by and probably just shrug their shoulders and onto the next because there's some yeah. more visually captivating pieces perhaps. But, uh, yeah. I, I, I care about where these trucks serve. There are some designs that I think are just beautiful and timeless. American La France, I think had some of the prettiest looking engines, but then you look at, look at a, a like Mac, Mac, you just get into a Mac truck and you are in a truck. You just feel like surge of testosterone and you can <laughs> take on anybody at any time. So yeah, it, it just depends. And uh, uh, when I go to events, I, I, I'll tell you what, I, I enjoy driving, which is kind of interesting to say because these things are not designed for comfort and they're often persnickety. And sometimes, you, I don't know if you've seen the movie Christine, but you feel like you're in Christine because it will do something sometimes and it will, it will do what it wants other times. But uh, other people drive. I like seeing the motion, and I can only see the world through my lens. And you know, I don't like driving the prettiest truck because I'd like to see it work. And if you're behind the windshield, you only get to see out the front hood. So, what have been the, some of the uh, greatest events that you attend? Because I know COVID has sort of blown a big hole in some of it. But you you said about some of the events you've gone with Firefest, and tell us more about that because that's a huge, huge event that gives a lot of people a great sense of fulfillment when they're able to attend it. But I suppose the last year or so they've not been able to yeah no we uh we were shut down last year i don't think anything rolled last year which is a uh, which is a shame but we'll get through this man we'll persevere we'll we'll get by this one way or another but in the meantime we just gotta gotta take it for what it is but pre-covid yeah they're fortunate that i mean in canada but we're very close to the united states we got some great friends the other side of the border so within probably about a three four five hour radius you know driving in a rig there are probably 40 events a year that we can go to and and obviously with our involvement yeah with our involvement with the magazine i mean we're fired and uh, eager to get to events basically to wave our flag as well right so mm. So that's that. As it pertains to Firefest, I'll tell you what, Pete, Firefest happened again because my nephew got me back in the, in the hobby. My brother-in-law and I started going to events and really enjoyed the, the social benefit of going to these places with these trucks and yeah. having a few drinks and a few laughs and going off. But uh, what started out is Keith and I taking Kyle to the same events I went to as a kid, morphed into Firefest. And, and kind of, if you go to an event, and I went to a lot of these events when I was 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, and I go back in my late 20s. There's a lot of the same people that really were in the same spot and <laughs> doing yeah. the same thing, right? Uh, uh, well, let's shake it up a bit because there were some very established events that there was not a new one. So we just said, well, let's, what can we do? What can we do that's a little bit different? And a lot of the events, there, there are two types of events. There's one for the truck. The truck owner event, it doesn't matter where you park. As long as you've got a water source, you can park your trucks and you know do a little bit of a cookout or get some snacks and maybe yeah. have a drink or two and have some fun. And then there are kind of commercial kind of touristy events where it's a little bit more pop and stance when it comes to special guests or making yeah, it a yeah, draw. Absolutely. And that's what Firefest yeah. does. But when we went to the city, we said we want to do a fire truck show. And they said, that's neat. Like, what can we do to draw people downtown? We want to do that. So then, you know, we would challenge ourselves. It wasn't just, you know, coming and parking. It was like we'd have a, a schedule of events with demonstrations and uh, special guests and, and different features. So, uh, yeah, Firefest. The, the first year we ran it was 2012, and we were told we'd be lucky if we got 15 or 20 trucks, and I think we had 42 or 43. We were told we'd be lucky if we had 500 people. I think we had closer to 5,000. Jesus. Um, 
That's and then, uh, yeah, kind of extend those through to 2019. Last year we had it and we had, including in service, I want to say we had 72 old truck, vintage trucks and then another 20 or so in service that were here, there and everywhere. Um, so we're pushing a hundred vehicles. And, That's incredible. Uh, yeah, they, and the way the city, and I don't count people, but the way the city told us, they said, you know what, you average between five and 6,000 people downtown at a time. And that turned over probably three times. So you're looking at upwards of, you know, 18, 20,000 people throughout the day. And there's a gentleman set the camera, do a, a shoot of the parade. And I think it's got over a million and a half views now. So there's definitely an audience and there's definitely a passion. Like I say, I've never been in a fire trucking team. Anybody with a frown on it. It's, uh, it's something it's so unique good. That, that brings to it, but it must be becoming, when you talk about doing it at such a large scale like that, it must rapidly become quite a huge time consuming thing. How do you bear the, the load of that in, in everything else that you do and it does the community step up is it a real strong community because people forget how difficult it is for organizers and how much you really have to put into it i'll tell you what when it got canceled last year it's incredible to find that it frees up and it, <laughs> it allows you to kind of as <laughs> i'd say over the course of the year probably 300, 350 hours would go into planning and executing the event for one day and you know what like i uh i'll tell you as far as the event's concerned it, it would be easy to burn yourself out if you allowed it to do that. And there were times I was like, holy cow, this is, this is something, but we always found a way to do it. Um, but you know, what you last year was, was a very sobering experience in the sense that, you know, people lost a day and I'd be in a supermarket or out and about and people, is Firefest happening this year? Well, I don't know. I mean, I hope so. If, if they tell us we can play, we, yeah. we've got some ideas, but you know, people one day, but I gained 300 hours. So, um, and I uh, got That's to do crazy. some other things that, uh, that was probably more uh, more healthy to contribute to my to my lifestyle and to my work and investing all that time for the community. But uh, and not that I, I mind doing it, but it's a big deal. Like uh, it's huge. But, uh, it's really what goes into. It. So for people who are listening in who have always had the ambition to get more involved with that community of collectors and stuff like that, what's the best way for people to reach out and sort of get that support? Because obviously, I don't know how many people will be aware of the, the vintage fire truck equipment, but they can access this stuff through the magazine, through the online. How, what's the best way for people to get in contact? I'll tell you what, Pete, I look forward to learning more about how the hobby operates on your side. Mm. And, and I look forward to the day where we get to meet. And I'd, I'd love to think that happen in the next uh, year or two. So I can't speak with any real expertise over your place. But in North America, like we said earlier, it starts with a passion. And if you want to get involved in the hobby, there are a lot of ways you can do it. You don't necessarily have to own a rig. I mean, you can just come to events. You, know, you can, they're, they're different. There's, there's a big club called Spampa. It's a, they're a members only group, but you become a member and you get a card and they have meetings, they host events. And there are a lot of fantastic, fantastic people at that, mm. uh, that work with, uh, with Spampa. That would be something people would consider the easiest way to get in. If you want to be in the hobby, just like the Facebook page. I mean, social media has been so instrumental in augmenting awareness and introducing things to people that they never even crossed their mind they might be interested in. So what I would kind of, if I was going to make one plea to people, and especially younger folks, you know, there's more to life than sitting behind the computer screen. Like I know you and I are doing it right now, but we both have something beautiful to look at. I would. Um, but exactly. when you look at these kids. <laughs> but I would also, you know, I would yeah. far, 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 given the choice, I would far prefer to be doing this in person with, with all of our guests. You know what I mean? Because that's the thing we're losing. We're losing that human connection. No, I hear you. But uh, to me, there's such a sensory experience about getting in a vehicle and especially a bigger old vehicle that if it could tell stories, could keep you up all night. Yeah. And feeling it come to life, selling the vinyl and the oil and fuel and, and you know what, having to turn a steering wheel that doesn't have power system <laughs> and having to crank down a window if it is advanced enough to have, you know, crank down. Like that. Uh, I just hope the younger generation and I hope, you know, society gives more attention to celebrating our past because we're only where we are because of those who came before us. And, and uh, there are times where I kind of shriek a bit because I think that, we've been cultivated and brought to believe that it needs to be fast paced and it needs to be quicker and better and hot, more hearing. And really guys, but, uh, yeah, to a certain extent, you're right, but we don't want to forget the simple things because there's a lot of benefit and there's a lot of value in, in really celebrating these vehicles and, and the history they represent. And it's the character building aspect of it as well. You know, when I hear you talking there, the process and the discipline 
that goes into learning these vehicles and, and appreciating where you've come from gives you a much greater moral grounding in the roots of the fire department and, and the fire service and that emergency services community as a whole. Well, and, and see, I, I don't know what I don't know. I don't know what it's uh, like over in the UK, but my heart just breaks for these volunteer firefighters and these, these firefighters that want to volunteer, uh, especially in the United States, because government regulators are crushing their ability to even become firefighters because they make them train to the nth degree, and I get it. People need to be trained. But they, they made it cost prohibitive for these volleys who have to pay to their own pocket to get training and pay to their own pocket to get equipment. And then they're not, they're not getting paid on the flip side. Like, like we get sort of bed for that. Right. And you're expecting these people to go and, and fight fire. And it's become, it's just, it's, it's a tragic reality when government and bureaucrat and people driving the machine just make it so difficult for these people to become firefighters. It's a problem. I don't know how uh, it's going to be interesting to see how things evolve because uh, when it comes to delivering service, to put a coin on it, it's they're, they're pricing themselves out of the market. There's there a lot of good people out there that want sort of communities that just can't. Yeah, I know. And when so much of it is expected to come from the individual at their own cost. I mean, in the UK, we're still very lucky that we get all of our training provided for us. But I know speaking to firefighters in America, but also in Canada, and they can spend upwards of $9,000, you know, getting themselves trained before they're even allowed to apply. You know, they have to accumulate uh, a lot of this specialist training. And it's a huge personal investment, which, you know, ha- comes at a great cost to other sacrifices in their own life and their families as well. Sure does. To do what? To, to serve their community and protect others, people mm-hmm. they don't even know. How, da- how dare I just they? Think- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if this government and bureaucrats would, would really come back to center and maybe work with these people and support them in ways that they're not doing right now. Mm. And in terms of return on investment, like you say, the amount you get from somebody like that, from somebody in the whole emergency services community, you know, frontline responders as a whole, not just not just the firefighters, you get more than you think you do because they're ultimately, you know, um, high-level high problem solvers. They have an interest in, in helping all aspects of their community. Absolutely. Brent, I really appreciate you spending your time today, mate. I'm going to go uh, and look through the rest of this with my daughter. For people that are interested in getting hold of the magazines, I know we're going to do uh, have a few chats in the future. What's the best way for people to get hold of the magazine and for them to reach out to yourself? Oh, sure, yeah. No, absolutely. We'd, we'd love to expand our audience online, vintagefiretruck.com, or we've got the acronym of VFT Meg, so VictorFoxTangoMeg.com. We're thrilled when... And we took the title over. At the end of the day, there were less than 900 subscribers back in 2017 and uh, two countries. And now we're up pushing past 2,500 subscribers in 13, or 13 countries. We've had some nice growth. And, and I'll tell you what, the more people that have it in their hands, it just seems like they're telling their friends and, and it's growing. So, uh, yeah, vftmag.com or vintagefiretruck.com and Facebook. And uh, we're a small little company, but... Anybody who needs to get a message to me, uh, either through email or, or through Facebook, uh, one way or another, it should, uh, should find its way. It's an incredible brand, mate. I love, I love the look of it. We'll be sharing all of that. It will be in the notes for the podcast. So I am guarantee when I go down and speak to the on-call guys, I know they'll be interested in seeing this. Have you heard the analogy of the two firefighters and the two steel balls? No. Okay, so uh, a friend of mine works for the FDNY. He works in the shop. And Pete, you got to talk to one of those guys because the machine they have keeping their apparatus on the road, their shops, unbelievable. Really? But the story he tells me, he goes, yep, he goes, it's always the same. He goes, two firefighters and two steel balls. And I said, what are you talking about? He goes, you can put two firefighters and two big steel balls the size of a beach ball in a room that only has one door and no windows. And you can come back an hour later one ball's missing, the other one's broken, and nobody knows what happened. <laughs> That's, uh, that is exactly the case. It's always the case. Every time we come on handover for a station and stuff like that, something has always happened and uh, nobody can say anything about it. I always say when we get delivered new equipment, we say, has it been tested? People say, yeah, and we go, well, it's, it's going to get tested. It's not been tested by a firefighter. We will test something until it breaks. We will do everything it's not designed to do and then a few pieces more. And uh, when it breaks, nobody will know anything about it. <laughs> Love it, brother. We'll send my love to the family, and uh, I sincerely look forward to speaking to you again real soon, my friend. Yeah, see, whatever we can do for you from over here, just let us know, and it was an absolute pleasure to have this time with you today. You too, brother. Take care of yourself, and I'll see you soon. Yeah, bro. Take care. All right.
Well, there we have it, everyone. That was my chat with Brent. Such an interesting guy. Really, really enjoyed speaking on and off the podcast about some of the great work that vintage fire truck equipment do. And this guy can talk forever about the rigs and the different designs and just the, you know, the upholstery, the materials, the technology. And they've got such an amazing community of people with such a wealth and depth of knowledge about how this equipment came about, some of the successes, some of the failures in the industry. Now, don't forget, if you want to find out a bit more about Brent and the team, you can head over to VintageFireTruckMagazine.com. Now, I'll be totally honest with you guys, I am an absolute geek when it comes to fire trucks. I love the culture that is in some of these incredible machines. It is really great to see a community like this still going hard with the passion that they have for the fire service, for the equipment, for the trucks, for everything that makes that rich heritage of fire service culture exactly what it is and exactly what got me into it. You have got to head over to Vintage Fire Truck Equipment and check out some of the incredible stuff these guys are doing. If you're the sort of person that loves to sort of get into the nitty gritty of how these things are created, I'd especially suggest you start with their Game Changers edition in December of last year. That is an absolutely fascinating read. Now, this really goes into some detail. In that Game Changers edition, they go into all of the dawn of the steam engine to the pre-computer age, celebrating all the eras where Apparator was skillfully designed and engineered to help the firefighter in the waves that was previously unheard of. Ultimately, we're talking about boys and their toys. And I don't mean that that it's only the boys that are interested in it. Some of these pieces of equipment are just fascinating, guys. You've got to head over there and check it out. It's huge thanks to Brent for coming on the show and a huge thanks once again to yourself for taking time out of your busy day to spend time right here with us on the firefighters podcast i hope if that tickled your pickle you're going to head over to vintage fire truck equipment and i sincerely look forward to seeing you all back here real soon on the firefighters podcast